My first product was literally a PowerPoint presentation that I made over a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. And I sent it off to about 20 friends and about half of them said, yeah, we'll, we'll put in some money to help you test this out. So I, I always kind of encourage like, do spend the time on that, understand the customer in the market that's invaluable. Welcome back, everybody. Rich Breaker, founder of Collector Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Mission Driven Podcast. Through this podcast, I'm really just trying to engage the next generation of aspiring entrepreneurs, help them get a little bit further, a little bit faster. There's a lot of content here about how to build team, fundraise, do all the things you need to do as an entrepreneur or as someone working for an entrepreneur to get the organization to scale so we can all say we accomplished something. So in this episode, I'm extremely excited to be joined by Tanvir Udin, who is the CEO and founder of Wholesome, a mission-driven impact company that specializes in global ethical and impact-focused portfolios while delivering its services through innovative technologies. This is actually his third venture. Uh, and prior to that, he was also a management consultant with a bit of a traditional work in the impact space before that. So Tanvir, thank you very much for joining us. It's great to have you here to speak about the work you're doing, the ride you're on, why you chose to get on for a third time. Um, and I guess as a starting point, it'd be great to have an introduction to yourself and the mission that you're on. Thanks, Rich. It's great to great to be here to um, to share the story of Wholesome and, and my entrepreneurial journey, impact investing. Yeah, I started my career sort of in traditional management consulting uh, and ventured more into the intersection of finance, technology, and sustainability, working from everything such as agricultural financing for farmers in Indonesia to building and financing solar farms in the Middle East. Um, and more recently into fintech startups that work at the intersection of finance and sustainability. So I've always loved working in the intersection of that space and, and, and yeah, just been, been happy to go along with the ride. What is Wholesome? What's the founding story uh, and what's the mission of the organization? Yeah, so Wholesome is, is really a culmination of the various different experiences I had in many different regions relating to finance and sustainability. There's a, a, a considerable amount of interest um, and demand for impact-focused investments and also ethical investing for those who come from, I guess, spiritual or um, cultural sort of philosophical norms about investing. Um, and at the same time, um, I've, wor I've done a ton of work working in, in both re remote communities, but also emerging markets where small, medium businesses and microfinance um, are so pivotal to the economy and they struggle to get capital. Um, so I took those two sort of gaps, need for capital for SMEs, globally, more more impact, ethical investments, and try to fill that gap together. What's the product? Like really simply, what is it? What does it do? Yeah, essentially the first product that we've launched is a small and medium business debt funding facility that we we operate through a managed fund that's licensed in Australia. So investors pool their money into the fund. We deploy it in collaboration with fintech fund uh, partners, as well as direct investments into small and medium businesses globally. And we operate as a, a, as, as, a as a fund that cycles money on a monthly basis, pays out the distributions monthly. Um, and that's the first portfolio that we have constructed. So what we want to do is grow this and then start to add on more portfolios to address various different sort of social environmental problems over time. There's a lot of impact investors, there's a lot of people who do debt, there's, there's banks, there's all kinds of different pools of money. How how does yours fit into the market and why did you decide to come up with this product versus say replicate something that others are doing? My experience has been in small medium businesses um, in the private sector, in essentially private space. So basically private markets and private investing are those that are not listed on the major um, stock markets or, or, or platforms. And so I thought, look, this is what I understand really best. So that's why I got into it. But in terms of um, in the in the private SME funding landscape, it has definitely opened up a lot in the last sort of five, 10 years. Most of the capital is still in the developed world. Um, most credit funds, if you're raising capital in the US or Europe or even Australia would be domestic. The emerging markets and particularly in countries that, are, um, that have um, gone through a lot of financial and technological change in the last sort of 15, 20 years, they're only coming to market right now. Impact investing generally as an industry has been dominated by the big development banks or the high net worth individuals. Um, so I wanted to try and service the average person who is living in a city in Australia or Singapore or the US, and they're looking at, I want my investment not just to go into the stock market, but I want to have direct impact. I want to be able to access these asset classes. So I'm sort of riding those thematic changes and those uh, opportunities that just are opening up now. What was the work that you were doing the last few years? Like, what were the questions you're trying to answer? Who are the people you're trying to engage? What is it that you're trying to understand so that you could actually 
formulate this portfolio or formulate this platform? The, the biggest one is, is there a customer problem that is big enough for me to solve? And so if we break it down, needing to understand that is this industry growing and is there people interested in that? And yes, generally the answer has been yes, and it's been booming. All the numbers kind of show that. In terms of the customer pain point, this was the one that I was uncertain about because initially, many years ago, when I first conceptualized this, it was just because a couple of family and friends said, hey, we're looking for new investment options. You know, you seem to have worked in these regions and what do you recommend? You, you seem to know about finance. The work was really going and constructing a, a number of portfolios and taking very early on the family, friends and fools, as they say, and then opening it up to more people and seeing that, okay, we're getting growth. Some people are actually reinvesting into those syndicated deals. Um, and obviously we're looking at the results um, and that kind of showed that, hey, the returns are there. We're able to reach asset classes that not, not many other funds or many other players can access. And, and as, as I mentioned earlier, one of our key strategies has been to partner with these new fintech platforms that are bringing SME investing in places like Indonesia, the Middle East, or Africa. That just wouldn't have been otherwise possible. So those testing, finding the right partners, um, and then building the conviction. And of course, then we need to raise capital. Um, and and really, I, I raised all of my capital from few, for, from primarily from people who were my first customers. They had the conviction and they said, yeah, we, we want to back this. We think we can grow. So that, that was incredible validation to be able to carry this forward. Explain the portfolios you hope to build. I mean, if you've built some, if you've already built the first one, it's totally complete, great. How did you go about building it? And more importantly, how do you assess the ethics and impact of the potential investments you're making? Our approach was we wanted, when we say ethical, we mean to exclude certain industries that we consider to be harmful to the to, to the world, um, the liquor industry, um, animal animal cruelty, um, and, 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 and certain sectors like that. So we, we exclude them and that's what we mean by ethical. In terms of the impact, we are aligning ourselves to the United Nations Sustainable Development Framework and saying that our investments um, have to align with one or more of these goals directly or indirectly. And what we will do is in our commitment to our investors is we don't have all the data on day one. We have all the theories of change. We've looked at the research and then we commit on a plan to start to document and record that impact over time. And we realize it's not perfect and it's an ongoing, ongoing development, but there are certain things that we are very confident about. The first one is access to capital. SMEs need capital, they don't have enough of it. And when they, when they don't have enough of it, it means that there is real struggle, whether it be at the microfinance level where people basically forego other income opportunities or at the SME um, or larger business level, it means that they can't grow and scale. Um, and so, so that's our absolute direct one. And then we're looking at finding innovative businesses that add on other things, like are they empowering women? Are they paying their workers right if they're dealing with minority and migrant communities? So this is the framework that we go by. Um, and admittedly, not perfect. We haven't got all the data, uh, but we have a clear theory of change, and this is this is what we're working towards. I, I can see, like you know, you're you're based in Australia. You mentioned Australia, U.S., Singapore, but then you've got you know like the Amazon. Like you got a really wide spectrum there. How do you how do you invest, and how do you identify the investments? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, in terms of um, our, our our strategy for investments is we do both direct deals where we evaluate a business at a time um, and we work with fintech platforms that bring deals from other markets. And we've tested a few of those platforms. We've identified the ones that we like working with for our initial fund um, and we've got relationships with more. And the benefit of that is they are partners with us in helping to source the deals and to manage that overall portfolio for us. Um, some of them would, would use algorithms where we set the credit um, sort of restrictions we want to work with, the deal sizes, the duration, um, and that way they they apply that framework and we co we continue to invest in that. Others work with us and they give us the deals and we can directly decide on their platform. So that is sort of the insight I, I gained when I lived in Indonesia and also Saudi Arabia for about three years, where I saw that these platforms were bringing deals to market, which traditional investment funds just don't have access to unless you partner with them. To kind of segue to your first part of the question, um, we only do debt funding and we do debt funding for businesses that have been operation for at least a year. So we're not doing startups, we're not doing equity, we're not sort of new business ideas or even like even if they are SMEs, they're not new. And all of our partners and collaborators that we work with, including the fintech platform, Platforms, we, we invest with ones where they've recorded and received their financial statements. So this is our initial, I guess, low, cons like a more conservative approach. Um, and, you know, where the future funds will identify new niche um, opportunities. But at the moment, this this uh, this approach is scalable up to over a billion dollars. So we have no doubts about growing the fund that way. You're currently pretty much in, pro in, in the pilot phase. You're learning a lot. What are some of the things you're hoping to learn through this time so that 
getting back to your idea of scale, like that billion dollars that you can position yourself to get to the billion dollars. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what, when I, when I launched a product and I put the minimum at, at $20,000, most investors, those who are even very bullish, they, they just go for the minimum. And, and so for me, that that's an interesting starting point because I want to validate that these people are going to go over and beyond the minimum and invest and top up. And then those same investors are then are going to refer to their other network and friends saying, hey, I actually made money out of this. This is what they're doing. They're doing a great job for the world. Um, you should get into it. The second is looking at the institutional play. So I, I obviously accept the full spectrum of any legal entity to invest from individuals through to um, in other funds as well, I'm interested to try and break into the family offices and institutional investors because they are interested in this space um, and they're always partnering with innovative fund managers that can help them achieve their mission goals as well. So that's the second thing that I'm trying to test. How do I break into that? Um, I've got some great leads on that at the moment, which are relatively on the smaller scale, but I know that what they need is two to three years of a track record. So that's my next KPI on that. Um, and then the third element is building relationships and execution capability to then develop very niche thematic funds. Um, so looking at how these three elements will bring disruption to many um, economies and those disruptions beyond the initial venture capital, beyond the initial philanthropic capital, there's going to be business financing growth capital. And that's where we come in where the VCs have gone in that helped incubate the next generation startups. Now they want to grow and scale. Where, where, where do those new funds come in? And that's, that's what I'm really interested in. And my relationships that I'm building with the, the global ecosystem around the emerging markets is around how do we work with you? Where does our fund come into your businesses and where do we kind of collaborate? How do we then support each other's distribution? Why did you decide to go with a debt model? But like with an equity play, you can get a lot of more upside potentially if you pick the right winners. Um, why go that route? I mean, you're small, you got, you have a lot of overhead for each deal. Um, how, how do you make that work? The, the primary reason is going back to the initial investors and the, and the pain points for the investors that I'm trying to solve, let's say in the community here in Australia, or even it could be the same in the US or Europe. Um, right now with the cost of living crisis, people are looking for more passive income investing and particularly investing that's not correlated to the stock market or the bond market. For me, it was how do I deliver short-term yield benefits for investors who care about that and at the same time maintain liquidity because there's been such a push up, sorry, pull back of capital um, away from not only volatile investments, but very long dated investments. So I opted for what was people's pain points right now. And it's actually worked out because there is still a lot of need for working capital finance. So for example, some of my Indonesia deals, we're, we're, we're investing from um, anywhere between two months to about seven or eight months, because these are typically invoice financing deals. These are small companies trying to fulfill an order with a larger company and need some capital to get by. But in terms of the, the, the idea of equity, so I was a bit wary about being another equity fund or another VC fund trying to tap into this space um, without myself having, I guess, a very clear specialization. And usually specialization is by a thematic or a country. Um, and I didn't want to do that too yet. But in the future, if we start to see that we're, we're developing some interesting operational capabilities in a market or a thematic, that is an option to look at for sure. And there'll be lots more demand for that. Absolutely. What are the data points or what are the stories or what's the, what's the cycle you need to show for people to trust you with real money? The, the most important thing initially is that people want to see um, their capital safe and they're seeing a return as, as per their expectation. You know, we have to track all those metrics. What's our duration of the portfolio? How does that change over time? What are the losses in our underlying investment partners and the locations we've invested into? So these are all the numbers we build up and we show. So that, that's something obviously we are very fixated on in this initial phase. The next big uh, um, uh, umbrella is really around the impact of valuation. And so we've, we, we've, we're partnering with a couple of our co-investment platforms to collect data. This is probably one of the biggest challenges in, in many markets. And, and it's also like, how do you measure the counterfactual? Like what did your, the extra additional dollar from your investment versus anything else? Um, so it gets into a little bit of a technicality there. Um, but I think overall, what we want to show is that the businesses we invested into, what are they doing? Are they employing more people? Are they in, investing into environment sustainable practices? Are they supporting minorities? These are the things that we want to be able to show and that will build the conviction that, you know, at the end of the day, you could go invest in the in a listed market uh, public company, or you could do this. And, and here's what we're actually doing on the ground. And here's how you can kind of you know, feel the impact. You've thought a lot about this, man. Like I, I can see you've, you've spent a lot of time thinking about this through it. 
you got some pretty clear ideas. How much of that do you think is due to your, say, the rigor of academia, getting a PhD in the space? How much do you think is working for big consulting? And how much do you think is because you had, you, you had two previous organization that you worked with so you kind of knew like the general process for starting your own organization like which ones were you drawing off of and what were some like the key things that you took away from say each side of your mm. or each aspect of your your previous experience yeah gosh the sort of difficult question to kind of quantify i mean look all of them had had an influence to play for sure I, when i when i got into my phd i i had no idea i was going to draw upon microfinance as a business proposition or an investment strategy. I had no idea. But through that process, I think through, because we, we in research, you've not only got to be very rigorous, um, but you've got to be able to really clearly articulate the, 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 the hypothesis that you're trying to test and then go and test it. So I think that really forced us to uh, think really hard about those issues. And because we need to look at the literature, it includes all the criticism that we have. I mean, my, my thesis primarily looked at the, the lack of ethics in microfinance and, and how that was causing harm. What does it mean to have an ethical version of that? So that was, that was really important. Um, the, the consulting work, really, I guess, was about collecting data and analyzing data in very interesting ways. So one of the projects I worked on was to actually build a model to estimate the risk, uh, the, 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 sorry, the poverty risk in supply chains for a large FMCG. So you've got to come up with interesting ways that are defensible to try and that, measure that and then lead to action. And then I guess the, the more recent startup experiences have been so customer centric. At the end of the day, I learn a lot from my customers because my customers, they really think hard and, hard and, and deeply about where they're investing their money and, uh, and what it means. And, and they're comparing various options. So I, I've gotten good feedback of, um, both from individuals and, and foundations about how they think about yeah. impact what would they like to see? Um, and, I, and, I, and I challenge them and say, look, what you're asking sometimes might just not be available. What's the alternative? And so that insight means that, okay, there's something else I can do in the meantime until I, got, I get that data. You've been through two previous startups, but what, what have you taken away from those, from those times, like those, those startups and, you know, whatever success you found or whatever lessons you learned, um, what, what was something that you took away from it that you think make this one, that, that you can bring to this one and you'll have a, a better chance or you'll have a, you know, a, a more stable path going forward. I think there's so much you learn. Like the, I, we, we focus a lot on the ideas and the products. Um, like having been a first time founder twice and also working in a scale up from where we had like only a few staff members and grew it to over a hundred. There's so much you learn in the execution. There's so much you learn in just the basic things. How do you manage money? Who do you partner with? How do you like keep abreast of the competition? How do you build culture and team? I think that 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 is necessary to learn and um, it's so crucial to success. Um, and then it took me many years. I actually, I wanted to actually do Wholesome as early as 2021 when I took a sabbatical from my work at Bright because I was trying to finish my PhD at the time. And I, I, I realized that actually, yeah, I want to go and jump this. I've got all this energy. I want to go and do it. I, the problem seems big, but I haven't tested and validated with customers. I have no idea if this is actually going to work. So I actually put it off for a few years. And that's when I got involved with Viro later that year. Um, and, and that was really a blessing. It was extremely difficult because, um, you know, we were, we were a young founding team. We were all figuring each other out and, and learning about, <laughs> at the time we launched into the electric car market, very hot topic, but how do you actually sell cars? How do you do it in a compliant way? <laughs> Figure out how to maintain a stockyard. Um, how do you deal with competitors and, and the OEMs um, not liking past what you're doing and the way you're disrupting their model? Uh, these are all new things to learn. I was actually very grateful for the opportunity because by the time I got to, to to Wholesome, I didn't have to think about some of the basic things like financial management, the legal side of things. I knew how to execute. I had done my customer validation. And then I was like, okay, now, now I know what the customer pain point is and I know my initial model. Let me just get that to market. Let me test it. Yeah, the, the thing is at the end of the day, these are um, these, this is a big industry and a big problem. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm not as stressed about, oh, someone's going to steal the idea or that time's going to run out. I think that maybe comes from a little bit of wisdom of being around the space for a while. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little bit more, I, I'd say a little bit less impatient than I might've been a few years ago, although my wife would probably disagree, um, that, you know, I'm still got that kind of taking all the energy and running through. Um, but yeah, I'm also just a bit more cautious about how I collaborate with people and really, I look through the numbers a lot more carefully than I used to. Yeah. And I was thinking a lot about, uh, and I've been talking to my friends about, yeah, I'm not like I've been traveling around the region. I have a number of partnerships that I'm building right now, 
but I'm not trying to build my own presence to compete with people that are already in the market. I'm trying to figure out how can I add value with the idea that maybe after two, three, five years of that, we end up knitting together a very large organization of people who have real domain expertise in their country or in that specific challenge, but that we found that we really like working together and have a greater scale together by not being the alpha in the room. Like, can you put five alphas in a room and get out a much better organization? And I, I'm just, I'm trying it, right? Because I tried to build something. I got to several markets. Uh, I nearly got to two more markets before COVID. And I'm like, man, this is a really heavy lift on your own. Can you make mm. this more enjoyable yeah. by working with others yeah 100 percent. and i think that that's really key um i um like right now with my scaling uh, sort of uh, approaches that i'm taking i'm looking at how do i partner with other fund managers um, and where, where i can be additive to what they're trying to do and how they can be additive to what i'm trying to do um, and that's just a lot it's a it's a lower cost of acquisition to go that way so some of the funds i'm speaking to now they're looking at oh you've got a fairly liquid product you could complement what we're investing in and, and we could have that element and also just even with the technology side like the good thing is technology is now commoditized in such a way where I'm looking my next set of innovations that I want to bring to market I'm looking at how do I collaborate with someone else so I've gone to some other funds that that operate as fintechs and said you've got you've got a front-end technology are you interested in like licensing or can we kind of use that somewhere so I don't have to go and build it myself so as a final question and and the the idea of helping the next generation what like if you were talking to someone who is 25 22 25 28 yeah you know, it's their first round their first rodeo what two or three pieces of advice would you give them as it comes to formulating an idea building a pilot and coming to scale after that pilot anything you can do like the first thing i'll say anything that you can do to build your your resilience um, because it's it's a rough ride uh, if you think about resilience across all the dimensions financial mental health physical um the more you can invest in that and learn how to do that would be great um i've got a core group of mentors and friends who who are the people i whose voices i always put above anyone else and and that's important because sometimes your own voice can be very negative and you might feel like an imposter but also you you'll meet people that you just can't work with the people who don't get it and then you need to kind of come back to the people who really understand you and so that support tribe is really really important i think i didn't build it by design but over all these different experiences i've met a number of people who are, are, are tangentially related to my space who know me the longest um and and who are always is full of idea and wisdom and sometimes correcting me as well. I think that people underestimate taking care of finances, but one of the things I did really early on was I, I really worked hard. I was doing my PhD and working at McKinsey 80 hour weeks because I wanted to get the PhD ahead. It wasn't a financial thing, but it ended up being a blessing because of how it helped me get into the space for my startup. Um, and I also did a lot of freelance consulting, which gave me new insights and skills in agriculture SMEs, which I did whilst uh, moonlighting another job, but I saved up a lot of money and that savings, I invested it and it's helping me sustain when I have low salaries in working in the startup space. So I think some of those things are really, it just puts stress off you. Like I'm like I'm, not, I'm okay if I need to draw down my savings a little bit because I've built that buffer up in my 20s to be able to invest in my 30s to do that. And then the third thing that I would say is that spend a lot of your time under, like listening to people, customers, um, people who are experts in your field, collaborators, spend more time on that in the early days than actually trying to go and make a product. I, I like every other young person that I meet, like they're like, oh, I went and built this website or I went and, you know, built this app and, you know, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm marketing this product. I'm like, that's great. Fantastic. You were able to execute to that, which is one important part of it. But how much have you spent time actually listening to customers and really understanding their pain points? And, and I say to them, my first product, when I, when I tested, wholesome was literally a PowerPoint presentation that I made over a couple of hours on a Sunday morning. And I sent it off to yeah. about 20 friends and, and about half of them said, yeah, we'll, we'll put in some money to help you test this out. So I, I always kind of encourage like, do spend the time on that, understand the customer in the market that's invaluable. <laughs>